Welcome back, folks, to the conversation series on Get a Grip on Lighting. On today's show, we got Webster and Ron interviewing Javid Butler. Javid is a lighting designer and ener energy engineer who holds an LC, a CEM, and a CMVP. Those are certifications. He has contributed to the development of many lighting standards, including RDM and SACN. I hope I got those right, Javid. And chaired the task group for E1.27 DMX512 cabling standards. Needs a better name. He presently chairs the E1.68 DMX512 Compliance Task Group. Another better name. <laughs> but in addition to the lighting standards, Javid enjoys teaching the fundamentals of lighting. He also writes science fiction under the pen name David Pax, Greg Eric. But before wow. we let loose Webster and Ron with Javid, we got to talk about LED-LLC.com. Light efficient design, brother. What do they got? They're always coming up with unique, innovative product, and this one is right up there with some of the best they've done. They're Breeze EV. So what they're doing is partnering with distributors. So that's very different than a lot of these other EV companies out. As a lighting distributor, we're always looking for different angles, other things we can sell. This is something you can sell today. Light Efficient Design has the best EV system for you, and they partner with you. They're not going to sell it direct. They're going to work with you. They're going to help you out. They're going to give you all the knowledge and the product you need to sell it. Your job is just to have the relationship and go out and sell it. Breeze EV. Easy, breezy, lemon, squeezy. And, of course, we're talking about the EV chargers and solar panels and other stuff. Where, Greg Garrick? At the Nailed Convention, September 13th to 16th. Dallas Market Center. Be there, be square. Get your kids and evolve. <laughs> let's evolve, folks. But right now, let's let, let, let's let loose Webster and Ron with Javid Butler on the Conversation Series. All right, everyone, welcome back to the conversation series about lighting controls. I'm the self-proclaimed lighting control specialist, Webster Marsh, here with my co-host, Ron Kuzmar. And today we have Javid Butler, who is an aficionado in lighting controls, been a part of a lot of development. But before I get into the spiel, Javid, you want to give a little brief introduction of who you are and what you do? Uh, certainly. Um, I'm a lighting designer and energy engineer. I hold uh, LC, CEM, and CMVP credentials. So I work both in lighting and in energy management. And uh, I have, over the past uh, 20 years, 20 years, getting old, uh, uh, contributed to a number of ANSI standards through both uh, ESTA, the uh, Entertainment Services and Technology Association, and the IES. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And, you know, because of your membership of these committees, as well as just a wealth of information that you've shared with the world via um, written columns and just other efforts, and the fact that you're also sort of a freelance lighting control specialist, you know, all of these reasons are why I wanted you to join us today on this on this podcast. So, you know, the first question, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, <clears throat> having so much experience in the industry uh, for such a long time, you know, how have you seen the technology evolve? It has been a very rapid evolution uh, and something that, that I find to be uh, very interesting. When I first uh, started in lighting, uh, going back to uh, high school, when I was uh, the student technical director, for my high school uh, theater and was uh, working with a Strand CCR 600 dimmer rack and a micro Q console. Uh, you know, everything was uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, limited in uh, terms of the capabilities of, of digital circuits uh, at the time. So to interrupt uh, you for a the, second, I'm just, just for our listeners to be able to visualize what a Strand CCR is. Would you mind just describing what it looks like and how you interact with it? So it was a, a large uh, dimmer bank that uh, had dimmer modules that were approximately this size for a, a single dimmer module. And the dimmer modules then connected to a, a telephone style patch bay where you would plug multiple circuits into one dimmer in order to control them together. So this was not dimmer per circuit technology, uh, nowhere near the control capabilities that we have today. Uh, if you wanted to create an area, you literally would use that patch bay to plug multiple circuits 
into that dimmer and that became the area that you were lighting. And so you'd have basically so you a spaghetti to... of wires going across each other and weaving around, exactly. plugging in just like the, the old style operators on telephones where you somebody would call and say, hey, can you connect me to somebody? And there would be a live person actually pulling plugs and plugging them into other things. Precisely. Uh, and there were a, a limited number of high power dimmers. So uh, you couldn't do any sort of flexible patching unless you had somebody operating the patch bay during the show, which, you know, it's always a risk because in the dark backstage, somebody could miss circuit something. So typically we didn't, didn't try to do any repatching during a show. Sometimes you'd wind up having to do a little bit of that just because of the, the limited number of dimmers. And so that's really the origin of the term patching as well. You know, if people have heard it the is. term soft or hard patching, that is hard patching. Soft patching is within the console, which is a more modern term. And there were two types of uh, hard patching. Uh, the the one that I experienced in in my high school was that spaghetti style patch bay, but uh, there were also slide patches that were commonly used. It depended on the manufacturer. Different manufacturers had different style of patches, uh, and they both had their advantages and disadvantages. And so you started in theater. So uh, to sorry to continue your story now. Well, I've had a lifelong interest in, in theater. Uh, going back to fourth grade, I wrote and produced a five-minute one-act play and rounded up all of the uh, people in my class to play different roles and met with the principal before school one day to uh, find a space where we could do the performance. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've always, always loved theater and I've always loved light. Um, I've got thousands of pictures of uh, different uh, sunsets and clouds, and you know, every time I see something that that just strikes me as being uh, interesting, I I try to take a picture of it uh, just to just to be able to have that uh, image to reference. Uh, so you know, I, I I love watching the way that that sunlight uh, changes shadows throughout the day uh, and throughout the year. Um, so, so I've, I've just always loved light. And so do you try to recreate that in theatrical senses or, or in architectural lighting to any degree? I have, uh, at, in various times. Um, uh, I, when I've done stage lighting, I, I try to incorporate natural lighting. Uh, for example, uh, one time when, uh, working, uh, Shoot, uh, the uh, the Crucible. A little, little bit of uh, ADD going on there. Sorry about that. But, no worries. Uh, 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 when, when lighting the Crucible, uh, I worked with the scenic designer to light the entire second act through the fireplace. Because when you read the script, the only source of light that is in the script is the fireplace. And then, uh, because nobody is specifically tending the fire during that scene, uh, I had a lot of fun adjusting the fire effect so that throughout the scene it goes from this, uh, you know, roaring, happy, you know, reds and yellows and oranges to, you know, deep purples and blues, and you know, going along with uh, the the tone in the script itself. So it was pulling everything together, pulling together that natural environment, as well as pulling together the, the events, the drama that was happening in the show. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a, I mean, honestly, I would have loved to see that um, because it just sounds so interesting. And, you know, with theatrical lighting controls, you know, that sort of on-demand functionality is critical. And so um, with the infrastructure that you had at the time, I was curious what you used to achieve that. Do you remember what console you had? Uh, yes, that was uh, uh, Strand Dimmers uh, with um, an ETC Express console. Hmm. So, so to that create the fire effect. Go ahead. Go, go, no, no, go ahead. 
so in that case, I was using the Flickr effects that are built into the console as part of the effects package. And uh, that was dimmer per circuit, uh, a strand uh, uh, CD80 SV dimmers. And so I was able to plug, as opposed to hard patch, uh, individual dimmers exactly the way that I needed to be able to create that fire effect. And so we see sort of a, an evolutionary stage from that that um, old hard patching format to to a more soft patching format in this iteration. And so from that transition, you know, when did you feel as though there was a change that happened when originally you had this really clunky hard patching format to a more streamlined format? Um, it's It's been a gradual evolution and uh, the technological evolution is is very interesting. It has a lot to do with the uh, semiconductor devices that were available or before that uh, uh, technology such as uh, uh, vacuum tubes, cybertron tubes. Uh, it really has a lot to do with technological constraints. So in the uh, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, uh, it was just less expensive to use large power devices and then physically connect circuits to those dimmers uh, than it was to use a larger number of smaller power devices. Now, as semiconductor manufacturing improved, it became more commercially feasible to uh, use a larger number of smaller dimmers and go dimmer per circuit. So we see the first dimmer per circuit system, the Kliegel P72 uh, dimming system, which had uh, 2.4 kW dimmers instead of uh, commonly a 6 kW dimmer in a hard patch system. And that P72 system then used a pin patch on the console. So it was still a hard patch, but it was now a low voltage patch where the operator would just sit and plug at the console with the zero to 10 volt control signal, as opposed to the line voltage power that's going out to the dimmers. And then from there, we started to see the development of um, uh, digitally controlled, well, not always digitally controlled, I'll come back to that. Uh, but we started to see the advent of digitally controlled uh, dimmer per circuit systems uh, in the, you know, the the first implementations were in the late 1970s and then uh, really starting to get into the wide commercial market in the early 1980s. Uh, but of course, at that time, there were still many, many hard patches still in right. use around the country. So, I mean, uh, would you say that architectural lighting design with DMX implementation nowadays really benefited from that evolution? They didn't really seem to struggle through the same challenges, at least when it comes to digital control protocols as theatrical lighting systems did? Well, architectural lighting has always uh, uh, borrowed from entertainment lighting uh, and, and the entertainment technology has propagated into the architectural market. Uh, you know, there are certainly, uh, you know, wall box dimmers, for example, that took a separate development path. But when you get into large scale architectural systems, uh, they have always uh, borrowed from entertainment technology. So you would see uh, dimmer per circuit systems go into, uh, you know, say an, uh, a large commercial atrium that uh, was mm -hmm. intended to have a dynamic feel to it, uh, or into uh, conference centers or uh, other spaces, uh, even even uh, smaller conference rooms would tend to to use the the control concepts that uh, were originally developed in entertainment uh, in order to achieve what they needed in those so architectural it's almost, spaces. It's almost like theatrical is the experimental area for people to test and improve the controls systems, and then architectural utilizes those. It, 
it's not deliberate, but yes, that is more or less the way that it works. Uh, largely because uh, theater has always needed to have a very high degree of control. So the the tools, the techniques, the design practices, those have always been uh, developed in theater. And then once that expertise has been established, uh, the architectural environment has has been able to utilize it. I, I'm generalizing there, but sure. you know, as a generalization, that that has been the way that it's worked. Well, I mean, you know, it kind of addresses something that a lot of people remark on, which is that theatrical designers feed into the architectural world and as a mm -hmm. result, bring with them certain knowledge that otherwise wasn't available in the architectural world. I mean, integrators, for instance, Ron here is an integrator. And, um, you know, this is sort of a, a new concept in a lot of ways to our standard facade color changing experiences where, oh, you actually need somebody to to hover over the project, over the low voltage terminations, over the intelligence and make sure that it happens correctly. Similarly, in, in theatrical world where you have a master electrician that does that. Um, but, you know, this is, this is fairly modern in concept to lighting design because before DMX really started to become popularized, um, you didn't really crutch it, you, you didn't rely on an integrator to achieve what you wanted to do because of the fact that it was a little bit simpler to achieve what you're trying to do. You had hard patching, you had physical connections, you had circuit dependent controls um, so that the lighting designer and the engineer could essentially put their heads together and achieve the result that they were looking for. But now um, there's a lot going on. There's so much changing in the, the controls world when it comes to architectural lighting design, and especially DMX is becoming even more popularized. And so um, integrators are becoming essential partners in, in a lighting design. And so most integrators also originated from theater. You know, you see a lot of the distributors or rental houses of theatrical fixtures becoming the integrators because they have such an intimate knowledge of the infrastructure for a DMX system. Relatively speaking, uh, DMX 512 implementation uh, in an architectural environment is simpler than many of the large stage shows that. No argument. Today. There. So, so what what I found in 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 my experience anyway, and I think in in many other uh, people's experience as well, is that the commercial lighting market will seek out people with an entertainment background because you know once you're used to uh, running shows with hundreds of universes of DMX five twelve, setting up an architectural system with you know five or six universes is relatively simple uh, so uh, architecture is uh, is picking up on that knowledge base uh, I, I do want to address one parallel which is that uh, as large high-rise towers started to uh, uh, grow up during the 1940s and 50s there were parallels in basic architectural lighting control such as the GETLC system which still exists today in, in a variety of, of formats. And the early GETLC systems were not too dissimilar from uh, the hard patch concept that uh, later uh, was replaced by dimmer per circuit. So if you look at early, early TLC systems, uh, you would have relays controlling individual circuits of commercial lighting, and then inside a control box, you would have a hard patch where you would literally jumper together multiple relays to create a control zone. Uh, so there were some parallels there, but they were nowhere near as sophisticated in the control strategies as uh, theatrical systems were even at the time. So with all of that in mind, I, I've got a curious question for you. Do you think there are some things that architecture is missing about this technology or not acknowledging or not utilizing to its most ideal potential? The, and the reason I asked yeah. and, and the reason I asked this question 
is because there's still a lot of struggle going on. A lot of issues on projects, you know, either misinstalled, not commissioned correctly, not programmed correctly. A lot of people are getting a lot of heartburn on architectural projects because of something going wrong. And I wonder if that's because it's technology that was developed for something else and is now being utilized for something that it wasn't originally intended for, or is it just that there's sort of a learning curve that needs to be overcome? It's more the latter. It's really a matter of market education, uh, which is why I dedicate as much time as I do to education uh, in the market. Uh, for example, fundamentals of lighting uh, here in Las Vegas, uh, opportunities such as this to talk with you gentlemen, um, light fair, uh, other trade shows. And uh, it, it first and foremost comes down to the experience of the electrical contractor. If the electrical contractor has a solid background in data and you can readily communicate to them both during the, uh, the bid process and then during the installation exactly what is required and how it should be installed, it usually goes fairly well. Um, if you have an electrical contractor that isn't particularly experienced in data, then they're going to be going through a learning process through that project. And because many electrical contractors will only do one or two DMX 512 projects during their lifetime, uh, that it, you know m maybe these days it's up to three or four, but you know it's not a day in and day out practice for them. So there's always that learning curve. Uh, then it's also uh, in part on the specification side and ensuring that the architect and the engineer are really detailing everything out during the design phase so that the contractor is receiving bid documents that are fully detailed. Uh, and towards that end, the IES has recently uh, developed uh, RP16 on control narratives and sequences of operations so that there's more guidance out there for design professionals to be able to properly and fully specify more complex lighting systems. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's definitely the latter. Uh, a lot of the struggles are either, you know, electrical contractors who are not familiar with the low voltage or it's uh, improper documentation on the front end, right? You can have the best electrical contractor in the world, but if you don't mm -hmm. have a team behind them, whether it's an integrator or at least have proper documentation up front, they are going to be fighting tooth and nail to get the system operational and working the way everyone intends. Exactly. They and and many times it comes down to the way that it's bid, right? When when we have uh, low bid contracts, um, you know, the the joke has always been, uh, you know, how can you tell the low bid contractor? Well, he's he's the one trying to figure out what he missed, right? That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, yes, <laughs> that, that joke has been around the industry for a long time. Um, yep, and. Um, uh, so it's something that, that as we see more and more complex lighting requirements, uh, whether that's due to energy codes with daylighting or, uh, whether that is due to customer, uh, desire for things like, uh, uh, tunable light for circadian entrainment, uh, or whether it's decorative lighting, uh, using color to enhance the appearance of an architectural environment, as we see more and more of these applications coming together, it's placing more responsibility on both the design teams and the contractors to really understand what they're trying to achieve up front and then effectively implement that. So do you feel right now where we are that we have a sufficient amount of information of readily available to these team members or should there still be more information for them to be prepared adequately it all comes down to the documentation um do you mind if i talk a little bit about history of lighting control no go for, for it 
So uh, we, we hear many times that uh, lighting uh, right now is a disruptive technology. And the reality is that lighting has about a three to 4,000 year history of being a disruptive technology. Uh, when the first people started taking shells and putting a little bit of moss in them and soaking that with oil, and now separating the application of light from the cooking fire to create a, a primitive lamp, that, that was disruptive technology. Then when you look at the Greek amphitheaters where they would use uh, mirrors to control sunlight to light their plays, that was a disruptive technology. Um, so all through the history of lighting, it's been this balance of the light source and then controlling how that light source is utilized, uh, whether that's in uh, the late Middle Ages and Renaissance where they would use uh, uh, flame as a light source, a, 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 a lamp that then had shutters or even perforated shutters to create gobos, you know, uh, you know, go, the, the concept of, of, a, of a pattern being used to manage light is hundreds of years old. It's not something that, that came up uh, uh, recently. Um, then getting into uh, technologies uh, such as limelight, uh, which is a modified form of gas light, um, you know, lighting and lighting control have always been disruptive technologies. And so <clears throat> we know how to do this, right? We, we have this long history within the lighting industry of innovation and development and experimentation. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily as much a matter of techniques as it is documentation. And that's where, uh, as we, you know, see project budgets and everybody's trying to get more for less money, that many times that collective knowledge, that, that deep history of understanding of light uh, falls by the wayside. You know, you can, you can know everything that there is to know about light, which, you know, it takes a lifetime. I mean, you could be, you know, a hundred year old person who has spent their entire life dedicated to lighting. But if, you aren't able to work with the design team to properly document that, then you don't really get the end result that you're looking for. So that really, to me, is 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 the challenge. We we have we we have an understanding of the technologies that are available. We know how to use them. We we know how to apply light uh, in a broad sense. Although we're always learning more, um, but communicating that to everybody who needs to understand it to successfully implement a project, that's where the challenge lies. So to, to kind of revisit the question then, is it that there's not a sufficient amount of information on how to document that's going on? Or is it that there is a sufficient amount, but people aren't reading that or following it or, or internalizing it? It, it's a combination of those factors. Um, there's a lot of information that's out there. It's very difficult for professionals to keep up with with all of the changes, with all of the recommendations. Um, it's also uh, a matter of uh, sometimes people who, you know, for example, electrical contractors who are only going to do a handful of DMX 512 systems in their career. Uh, you know, is it really worth it for them to learn all the ins and outs of installing DMX 512 if they're not going to use it every day? Um, so it, it's all of those factors. And frankly, the only way to address that is through broad education, uh, through connecting with people uh, at the points where you can connect with them. Sure. So, I mean, you know, from from a designer standpoint, you do a lot of design work and I imagine a lot of documentation to support that, you know, um, is there a forum that you can then use to share the, that knowledge 
that you have obtained in that documentation? There are multiple forums. Um, uh, trade shows are the one forum that, that I use more than anything else. So uh, uh, presentations at Light Fair, presentations at other uh, industry trade shows, uh, such as Light Show West, um, and then also local training. Uh, so uh, when we do fundamentals of lighting, I, I like to try to expand people's mind a little bit, uh, maybe more than what they really need for uh, their immediate day-to-day -day work, but at least get people thinking about that bigger picture. And so Fundamentals of Lighting, just to clarify, is an educational series from the IES, usually through a local chapter. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm based in Las Vegas, so uh, I have a number of colleagues here that uh, uh, come together to uh, teach Fundamentals of Lighting as part of the Las Vegas section, yes. So as you're going through a, and doing these trainings, it's um, right. It's really important, obviously, to train anyone new who's up and coming, anyone who's newer to being a designer. How how do you find or do you struggle with training of the older dogs? Right. How do you find working with architects and designers who have been around for a while, who maybe don't want to be as up on DMX 512 and some of the other control protocols that are being used. How do you find struggling through some of that to help them improve their documentation and communication with other contractors and other trades? Uh, it, it, as in, has somebody told me to my face that all that we really need here is just a basic snap switch? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, that, that, that has happened many, many times. So there are two ways that I address that. Uh, the first is to break down the functions of what people are familiar with, right? Because this is an evolutionary process. So we, we have to look at what people are comfortable with and use that as a starting point. So if you think of a traditional light switch, uh, you know, ones that uh, you know, many people have grown up with and are all around us in, in our homes and in the commercial environment, there's a number of things that that switch does. Uh, of course, it controls the actual power to the controlled zone through the, the switch itself, but it also has a user interface, right? And, and until you really start to break down a switch, you know, you don't really think about the fact that that handle is a user interface. It's very rudimentary, but it's a user interface. And it also provides status feedback. You know, if, yep. if you have a light switch that is out of view of the controlled zone, you can still tell the status of the lights in that zone by the position of the switch, assuming it's wired correctly and, and things like that. So, so that's the first thing that I try to do is to try to break that down and say, hey, guys, you know what? When we're talking about an occupancy sensor or even better, a vacancy sensor, all we're doing is we're taking that switch that you already know and love, and, and we're just breaking it apart. We're putting the power pack up in the ceiling. We're putting the user control at a convenient and comfortable level, and we're providing the feedback probably through an LED indicator on the switch instead of just the physical position of that toggle. Nothing all that different, but it now allows us to add an occupancy sensor so that we can have automatic shutoff. Uh, so it's it's not all that different. It's not all that complicated. Um, that's one of the places that I that I start. Now, there are certainly times where, having said that, somebody comes back and says, "Switch is simpler. I just want to switch." So in that case, I will typically just take over the design and documentation, and perhaps just give them a switch. Right, maybe maybe instead of a a uh, two position uh, normally open switch, uh, you know, a typical light switch, uh, maybe I'd give them a, a center off toggle. So you flip it up for on and flip it down for off, and then just do all of that back end documentation so that they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to think about it. It's just tell you what, <clears throat> I get it. You would like a nice birthday cake. 
let me head off to the kitchen for a little bit. I will come back. I will give you a nice birthday cake. Please enjoy. And and then they don't have to worry about it. So it uh, it, it it just helps avoid those those sorts. I mean, of you issues. bring up you bring up an interesting thought exercise here that a lot of people may or may not consider when it comes to designing a lighting control system, and that is just because what the end user wants, at least in what they're asking for, is an outdated and usually code non-compliant device, that doesn't mean you can't provide the intent all the same. And so I think, you know, that's something that maybe people need to start thinking about when it comes to, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've also been asked for either a snap switch or a wall box dimmer in a space that absolutely cannot have that. But, you know, there's there's kind of two choices here. One is to educate them about energy code and tell them why it's not possible, or to take that intent that they're communicating and still give them that intent while still meeting the, the requirements of energy code and, and local jurisdictions. And so I think that that's a, an element that could be utilized much more readily um, especially with modern lighting control systems. And we as an industry probably do need to do more training in that regard. Um, uh, you know, Webster, you and I have talked about some of the work that's being done at the national laboratories. Um, that's great work, but we need to connect that. We need to be plugging that together so that people are, uh, you know, people who are implementing out in the field are getting the benefit of that knowledge. Uh, so there does need to be a lot more education around uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and frankly, many of the issues of communication are not ones that are directly related to the technology, they're related to the psychology. You know, if, if, if I'm dealing with somebody who has spent 40 years designing controls that uh, are uh, dealing with, uh, you know, just switches and relays and things like that, um, it really uh, isn't, you know, I'm not going to be able to convince them to do something else. I'm not going to be able to, to override that history that they have, but I am going to be able to do that work myself. So it, it's that psychology, it's that connection that you have between uh, people of different ages, different experiences, different backgrounds, and understanding that psychology so that you can make that communication path easy. That's that's really the, the biggest thing. If you make it simple, even somebody who, you know, doesn't think that we need complex controls is going to, uh, uh, you know, generally step back and say, oh, okay, that's fine. If you're going to take care of that, fine. Just, you know, give me the documents. I'll add them to my drawings. Done. Well, and I wonder also, I imagine that that design that you described with the um, kind of recreating the rocker switch experience with a low voltage switch, you know, how I much love work... that, by the way. Love that. <laughs> love it. How much I'm going work to use did that you, myself. Did you put into achieving that, though? Um, I, I don't think it's really a lot of work if you step back and look at that big picture, right? It's just a matter of you know, one way or the other, you're going to select a device. And so once you select a device, uh, you know, that's that's the way that you're going to go forward with that particular project. Um, so it's not necessarily work in terms of the the work that has to be done for the documentation. Well, you do have a, a good amount of knowledge of that front backed up that. Yeah. So you, you needed to understand the system's capabilities before you could select that device. Uh, yes. Yeah. So... So you do need to have uh, experience and you do need to have that, that broader worldview uh, to, uh, to actively listen, uh, to, uh, to understand what people are trying to achieve. That does take practice, that takes experience.
Yeah, and I, I, I do... <sighs> I do love that because I, I personally, I mean, I obviously embrace controls. So I've never taken that step back to look at a rocker switch and sort of detail it out that way. And I, I'll i be honest, I have a hard time sometimes communicating uh, that to contractors in the field and communicating the system and explaining to them why they need the motion sensor and why they need this and why they need that. And, and to be able to sort of step back and walk the entire team through, you know, really breaking it down, uh, I think would is something that would help a lot of people, not just to sort of get the controls in, but to help everyone understand that while we're adding all of this, we're really not changing all that much from the old, the old ways of, of doing things. So uh, really, in many ways, we have a lot of the design principles, the light, the use of light and the control of light. You know, a lot of that goes back to the ancient Greeks, you know, and, and the fundamental principles haven't changed. It's just that they've the technology has allowed us to do it more precisely and more efficiently uh, and uh, more rapidly. You know, I mean, I mean, trying to point a mirror around is is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, not when you can uh, have a control through a, a digital tablet, right? But when uh, when you look at the, that larger picture, though, and say, what are we really trying to achieve here? What are we trying to accomplish overall? That that really uh, hasn't changed in a long time. That design process. And uh, so I think we need to be training people on how to follow that design process more. And uh, then as part of that training, uh, the documentation to use our, our modern technology. But I think that that also addresses one of the things we were talking about when we were interviewing Dan Blitzer, when he, we were talking about this fear that people experience when it comes to technology that's mm. unknown or unfamiliar. And I think if we do train people in a way that is not taking everything that we've done before and throwing it out the window, but rather adapting it to a new medium, we can really achieve both education that people get and also technology that people don't fear. Precisely, precisely. Um, another part of that, that uh, understanding, and I'm going to go a little bit far out here, um, <laughs> it is understanding how we fit in the world and then how our lighting practice fits within that world. Um, we're in the process of a, a social evolutionary step change right now that started about 1850. Uh, and we have technology that has come from that step change, right? If you go back to 1820, most people earned their living as farmers around the world. Um, you know, the, the most advanced lighting at the time was uh, a various form of uh, a whale oil or, or a kerosene lamp. And, uh, you know, that, that's just 200 years ago, right? just a few generations of, of humans. And so uh, we still have the, the, um, the emotional resonance that humans developed over the you know, roughly 2 million years of our ocean starting on the savannas of Africa. And we have to recognize that, right? I mean, we've got 2 million years of human evolution and experience and 200 years of advanced technology. You know, we, we have to balance those things. We have to um, look at that big picture and, and take that step back and say, what are we trying to achieve? What is the end goal? Uh, and when we do that, then I think we wind up delivering better solutions overall. So you mentioned 
right? So obviously, as energy codes continue to change and adapt, and lighting systems and all building systems have to, you know, conform to those codes, you mentioned earlier, being sort of an energy engineer. So as uh, I guess, in, what really does that mean? Right? What really is an energy engineer as far as the lighting industry is concerned? And then a segue to that is also how do you help end users, right? Not the designers, the end users who, if you're on part of the team who may not understand all these codes, how do you help them understand the needs and the requirements and sort of break that down for them? So uh, I'm a certified energy manager and a certified measurement and verification professional. Those are two of the credentials I mentioned earlier. Uh, those uh, credentials are administered by the Association of Energy Engineers, which uh, on a lighting podcast, probably only a couple percent of the audience is going to be familiar <laughs> with. Um, but the AEE is the organization for energy engineers, much as uh, ESTA is for entertainment uh, personnel, or the IES is for illumination engineers. And uh, locally here in Nevada, I'm, I'm uh, also education chair for the uh, Nevada chapter of the Association of Energy Engineers. And typically, energy engineers are looking for the most efficient uh, solutions and ways to reduce the demand uh, within their, their buildings or on their properties without affecting occupant experience. Right. Um, you know, we certainly could just set all the thermostats to 80 degrees and save energy, but that isn't going to make for a good occupant experience, particularly here in southern Nevada. So uh, energy engineers work to find that balance. And that relates to lighting controls through looking at, uh, you know, first of all, those energy codes and what those those code minimum requirements are in terms of uh, lamp and fixture selection and code requirements for controls. Uh, those code requirements are starting to get fairly specific. Uh, the IECC, the International uh, Energy Conservation Code, uh, requires 600 square foot zones for occupancy sensing. Uh, that's a relatively small zone compared to uh, previous years. Uh, they also require very specific daylighting requirements. So uh, anywhere you're near a window or a skylight, uh, there's going to be a requirement for daylighting controls that reduce the electric load of the building when there is sufficient daylight available in that zone. Uh, so the first education for the end user is simply to to let them know that that these are requirements you know code minimum requirement and many end users or their representatives in the form of building managers building engineers uh many of them are just going to want the code minimum right so in terms of communicating to them you lay it out as you know this is what the code requires uh, this is what the code allows, and you know they may they may grumble about it a little bit if they're not getting what they want. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, just simply starting from that perspective uh, at least gets them aligned to a common baseline, right? But there are also users that want to have uh, an above code experience. Uh, maybe they're looking to achieve a well building standard or a USGBC rating. And uh, they are trying to achieve more than what that, that minimum code allowance is. So then there can be conversations about uh, cost benefit that you know get into a lot of detail about uh, the uh, operational cost of, of systems. Uh, you know, looking at the, the life cycle energy costs and the way that more efficient light fixtures and lighting controls can, uh, can really affect operational expense over a long period of time. Those can get to be some very exciting 
uh, conversations uh, from an energy engineering perspective. But so, I mean, a lot of what you do is almost just education for the end users that they understand the benefits of what it is that's being implemented for energy purposes. Absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, it there's, sounds there's... like, yeah. So, so, I mean, as far as having someone such as yourself on a project, um, the benefit is really when you connect with the owner, the stakeholders, whoever it is that's going to be ultimately benefiting from the system. It's not that you're brought on to just give a documentation package that somebody then incorporates into their drawings. The, the real critical component there is that there are conversations that need to happen at the outset of the project. It, those conversations are the input, the documentation is the output. And that that has been the design process for thousands of years, you know, listening to what the <laughs> owner wants, understanding what the needs of the space are going to be and how they might change over time. Those are all of the inputs. The documentation think, to show the contract. I think the, the thing is, though, that maybe that's part of where the process is, is not being completed because a lot of designers um, are stating that they don't get the input they need. They don't get either the conversation with the owners or the stakeholders or the owners and stakeholders don't have the desire for something. They don't state what they want. And so the, the designer has to kind of just run with something um, or there's not even a, an OPR, an owner's project requirements for a project. And therefore they have to go digging for, for the information. So it sounds like, you know, really to be effective in lighting controls, there needs to be not just an inquiry, but an education with whoever's going to be the end user. Absolutely. That's, that is the most effective way to, to do that. And, and perhaps what we need in the industry is uh, a little bit of, of a formalized process that uh, lighting designers and, and control designers are trained on to be able to really determine those, you know, if, if there isn't an actual OPR document, um, to be able to develop a, a lighting OPR that is based on the the um, the conversations that, that do occur that 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 do happen um, and also a little bit of guidance as to you know, when to push right because there are times where uh, there really are decisions that that need to be made by the owner direction that's required from the owner and you know sometimes, you need to just go back and say, you know, hey, folks, I need this information in order to deliver what you are looking for. Um, uh, you know, an alternative is to simply throw something out there in the documentation and then see whether anybody pushes back on that. But that that has mixed success, right? Because if, if you put something into the documents and then it ultimately isn't fully aligned with what the owner is looking for, then when the contractor comes back with the VE, all of your detailed design work is just out the window, right? But you still have responsibility yep. on the project, right? <laughs> right. Well, so, I mean, we're almost out of time, but I just kind of want to summarize uh, at least a, a chunk of what we've discussed here today, because I feel like we, we've darted around a lot of different topics, really interesting stuff. Um, but ultimately, you know, lighting and controls have hand in hand been disruptive technologies for as long as really they've been in existence in an artificial sense. And, you know, to treat it as disruptive but problematic isn't really the good choice because really it's more of how does it become disruptive and facilitate the next step forward. Um, and so the arguments presented here today are that the best way to achieve that is to extract the intent from whoever's going to be working with whatever the lighting is and how they want to interact with that lighting and then thoroughly document it so that contractors can implement it adequately and not catch you off guard with a valued engineering proposition that 
takes all of that work that you've put into that documentation, tosses it out the window and says, here's a cheaper alternative. And you can kind of stand behind that documentation and say, well, you know, these are the things that we talked about. And when you go with that value at engineering option, you're going to lose X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, is that really what you are okay with? But I think additionally, um, one thing we didn't mention here is how we get to a value engineering proposition, which is price, because ultimately a price tag should be something that should be communicated at the outset so that it's understood, okay, you know, if you want a, you know, LED wall on the side of your building, but you can only afford $100,000, that's a little outside of your ability to afford that. Um, <laughs> But I think that's also, again, part of that initial conversation when you talk about intent. You know, what is the goal of the project? What do the end users want? And if they don't say anything, if they don't really have an idea, then that's where education comes into play and talking about, okay, here's the pros and cons of everything. And when it comes to price, uh, that is a good place to... Uh, you know, to, to just throw stuff out, right? So somebody comes to me and says, you know, hey, I want a, you know, I want an LED wall. And I go, okay, great. Are you looking for, you know, a million dollar LED wall, a $10 million LED wall, or a $50 million LED wall? And as soon as I mention the word million, I know how much they want an LED wall. Um, yep. <laughs> and uh, from there, we can, discuss, you know, other options. Uh, and there are a lot of create, that's a whole nother discussion, whole nother conversation about <laughs> doing LED walls and the different things that you can do to, yep. to really deliver a lot of impact for relatively low cost. Uh, but, uh, you know, that very quickly sorts out, uh, you know, who's, who's serious and who isn't. And if somebody comes back and says, I want the $50 million LED wall, then you have to do the, the Frank Geary approach and go, great, put that into an escrow account and I'll start designing. Um, you know, because of course there are some people who will tell you that they want a $50 million LED wall and then come back and tell you that they have a $1 million budget. Um, right. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Yes, you know, we, we need to be working on all of these things. We need to be working on that communication. We need to be uh, helping to identify uh, price so that uh, there's alignment all the way through on what things should cost in order to deliver on what the owner's expectations are. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us. You know, this was a really informative conversation and I hope our listeners really got a lot out of it. And maybe we'll pull you back in to talk about LED wall design and, and documentation. <laughs> but until then, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Easy breezy lemon squeezy. Let's go to led-llc.com. Breezy V, Greg Eric. That's right. That's a lot of easy, easy, easy. I liked it. Breeze EV, man. <laughs> They've got yeah. it. So if you're a lighting distributor and you want to do vehicle chargers, which you should consider, partner with Light Efficient Design because a lot of those other ones that you talk to or you hear about are going direct. Light Efficient Design is not. They're working with you. They're going to partner with you. They're going to give you everything you need. They have a wall mount, single pedestal. They've got all the different mountings, a level two, fast charging, everything you need. Light Efficient Design, Breeze EV. Coming in hot, go to led-llc.com. I also want to tell you about their Solera solar lights. That's a great product line as well. So go with the, you know what? Go easy, breezy, lemon, squeezy with led-llc.com. And of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. What are we doing, man? We're doing so many things. This, this association is rocking and rolling, man. Join our committees, man. We got committees rolling all the time. We're talking about sustainable lighting. We're talking about darkness restoration. We're talking about uh, social media market. We got all sorts of committees. We're going to set one up on 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 uh, government procurement committee. Come on, folks, got to get in nailed. We got a convention coming up at the Arc with the ArcLight Summit, September thirteenth through sixteenth at the Dallas Market Center. What are you waiting for? Let's get it going. Get down there. We got a ton of great topics. It's hosted by Superman himself, Tom Butters. That's right, Superman himself, Tommy B. So come down. 
and check us out at NALD.org. And of course, Greg, thanks to Javid Butler and Ron and Webb for hanging out in the Get a Grip on Lighting digital room and talking lighting controls. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>